welcome to the deep dive. Today, we're diving into the fascinating world of electric charges and fields. Oh, that's a great one. Yeah, it is. It's chapter one of India's NCERT class 12 physics textbook. Nice. So huge thanks to the NCERT for making these awesome resources available. Yeah, they're great. For everyone. Absolutely. We're going to try to break down some pretty complex ideas yeah. in a way that makes sense, even for someone, you know, maybe like a 15-year-old okay. who's just starting to learn about electricity. Sounds good. So um, what do you think, like, what's the coolest thing about electricity to you? Well, I think it's amazing that something like a tiny spark, you know, when you take off your sweater yeah. or like a giant bolt of lightning in a thunderstorm can be explained by the same basic principles. Right. That's what we'll be exploring today. Yeah. And the chapter kicks off with those everyday examples, right? Yeah. Reminding us that it's not just something in the textbook. Right. You know, it's all around us. It is. And in fact, this whole chapter focuses on electrostatics. Yes. Which is kind of a fancy way of saying we're looking at charges that aren't moving. Exactly. So we're talking about static cling, not electric currents yet. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So before we like dive into all the formulas and laws and stuff, hey. I'm curious, like how did we even discover this stuff? Where did it all begin? So our understanding of electric charge actually goes way back to the ancient Greeks. Wow. Okay. Yeah. They noticed that when you rub amber... Huh. which they called electron, mm. it could attract small objects. Interesting. And that simple observation was kind of the spark Literally. that ignited the entire field of electricity. Yeah. So that's where we get the word electricity from yeah. rubbing amber. Yep. Wow, that's amazing. It is. It is. Um, okay, so, but how did we go from, you know, rubbing amber to understanding that there are different types of charges? Right, so... Through lots of experiments, scientists observed that um, charges come in two types, and we call them, you know, positive and negative. Okay. And they interact in a very predictable way. Okay. Opposites attract and likes repel. Like magnets. Exactly, like magnets. Okay. You know, a north pole will always attract a south pole. Right. But two north poles will push each other away. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, so it's like there's this invisible force between them uh -huh. that either pulls them together or pushes them apart. Yes. But how did scientists figure out, like, which one was positive and which one was negative? Right. So it's actually a convention that was established by Benjamin Franklin. Okay. You know, he observed how objects like glass rods and silk cloth behaved after rubbing them together. Okay. Okay. And he decided to call the charge on a glass rod. He called that positive. Okay. And the charge on silk negative, mm -hmm. it could have easily been the other way around. Oh, really? Yeah, it's just a convention. Wow. But thankfully, everyone kind of agreed to stick with Franklin's system. Imagine if they didn't. Oh, yeah. What a mess that would be. In total chaos. Um, okay, so one of the fundamental concepts, I think, in electrostatics is the idea of conductors and insulators. Right. And you've probably heard those terms before. Yes. Um, I know that conductors allow electricity to flow easily, like the wires in our homes, and insulators block the flow. Right. Like the rubber coating around those wires. But, yeah. like, why are some things conductors and some things insulators? Yeah. So it all comes down to how easily charges can move within a material. Okay. So, for example, metals have these loosely bound electrons that can freely move around. Okay. So think of it like cars zooming along a highway. Okay. These free electrons are what allow the current to flow easily through the metal. Okay. Whereas insulators, on the other hand, they have electrons that are tightly bound to their atoms. Okay. So it's more like those electrons are stuck in traffic on a bumpy road. I like that analogy. Yeah, they can't move very easily. Okay, so the rubber coating around a wire is like a barrier. Exactly. Preventing the flow of charge. Yeah. And keeping us safe. Exactly. And that's why you don't get a shock when you touch the rubber handle of a hairdryer. Right. Even though there's electricity flowing through the wires inside. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. So we've talked about different types of charges and how they attract or repel each other. Uh -huh. But what about the charge itself? Like, what are its properties? That's a great question. So one of the most fascinating properties of electric charge is that it's quantized. Quantized. Okay. Yeah. And this means that charge exists in tiny packets, like grains of sand, you know? Okay. Can't have half a grain of sand, right? Right. It's either a whole grain or no grain at all. Gotcha. The same is true for electric charge. So each packet of charge is the charge of a single electron. Okay. Which is the smallest unit of charge we know of. So even though it looks like charge is continuous, uh -huh. it's actually made up of these like tiny little units. Exactly. Wow, that's pretty mind-blowing. It is, and this idea of charge quantization 
has some really important consequences. One of them is the law of conservation of charge. Okay, I've heard of that. Yeah, have you heard of that before? Vaguely. So the law of conservation of charge states that charge cannot be created or destroyed. Okay. It can only be transferred from one object to another. Okay. It's kind of like playing with Lego bricks. I like that. You can build different structures, but you can't make new bricks out of thin air. Right. You have to use the bricks you already have. Okay. So when we rub amber with fur, for example, we're not creating new charges. We're simply transferring electrons from one material to the other. Yeah, Jeff. And this law is one of the most fundamental laws in physics. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay, so the chapter also mentions something called Coulomb's law. Yes. What is that all about? So Coulomb's law is a fundamental law in electrostatics. Okay. And it tells us how strong the force is between two point charges. Okay, so what exactly is a point charge? Yeah, so a point charge is basically an idealized model of a charged object where we assume that all the charge is concentrated at a single point. Nice. It's a simplification that helps us, you know, make calculations. Okay, and what are the things that determine the strength of the force? Right, so there are two main factors. Okay. One is the amount of charge on each object, okay. and the other is the distance between them. So the more charge an object has, yes. the stronger the force it exerts. Exactly, and the closer two charges are, mm -hmm. the stronger the force between them. Okay. In fact, the force is proportional to the inverse square of the distance. Okay. This means that if you double the distance between two charges, the force between them will decrease by a factor of four. Wow, so distance really matters. It really does. That explains why I only get a shock when I actually touch a doorknob. Not when I'm standing, like, a few feet away. Precisely. And how did Cullum figure all this out? So Cullum was able to figure all this out using a very sensitive instrument called a torsion balance. Okay. So he basically measured the force between two charged spheres. Mm -hmm. Okay, and carefully analyzed how the force changed as he varied the distance between them. What a, what a physics rock star. He was. He definitely made a groundbreaking contribution to our understanding of electrostatics. Okay, so to make things even more concrete. Yeah. The chapter calculates the force between an electron and a proton, right. which are the two fundamental particles that make up atoms. Yes. And that force is pretty strong, given how tiny they are. It is incredibly strong. So the electric force between an electron and a proton is much, much stronger than the gravitational force between them. Wow. Yeah, and that's why we see these static electricity effects like, you know, our hair standing on end. Right. The electric forces are overcoming the force of gravity. That's pretty amazing. It is. Okay, so, so far we've been talking about the force between just two charges. Mm -hmm. But what happens when there are multiple charges involved? Like, does it get really complicated? It can get more complex, but thankfully we have a principle that helps us deal with multiple charges. It's called the principle of superposition. Superposition. Okay. And this principle states that the total force on a charge due to multiple other charges okay. is simply the vector sum of the forces due to each individual charge. Okay. I think I get that. Okay, good. You just add them all up? Exactly. You break it down. Okay. So imagine you have three charges, A, B, and C. Okay. Charge A is attracted to charge B and repelled by charge C. Okay. So to find the total force on charge A, we first calculate the force between A and B, Okay. then the force between A and C, mm -hmm. and finally we add those two forces together, oh. taking into account their directions. Gotcha. So like a triangle. Exactly. The chapter provides some helpful examples with three charges arranged in a triangle to illustrate how this works. Okay. So we break it down into smaller pieces. Yes. That makes sense. It's a very useful tool. Okay. This is all starting to make sense, but there's one concept that's still a bit fuzzy to me. Sure. And that's the electric field. I've heard this term before, but I'm not sure I really understand what it is. So the electric field is a fundamental concept in electrostatics. Okay. And it helped them describe how charges interact with each other. Okay. Even when they're not in direct contact. Oh. Imagine you have a single charge just sitting in space. Okay. This charge creates an invisible field around it. Okay. That can exert a force on any other charge that enters that field. Oh, okay. It's kind of like a force field in a science fiction movie. So it's like an aura surrounding the charge. Exactly, an invisible aura. Okay. And the strength of the electric field at any point in space is defined as the force per unit charge yeah. that a test charge would experience at that point. So instead of calculating the force between two charges directly, uh -huh. we can use the electric field as a shortcut. 
Exactly. The electric field is a powerful tool that allows us to visualize and analyze the forces between charges okay. in a more general way. This is all very fascinating, but I have to admit, it's a bit hard to wrap my head around something that's invisible. Right. Is there a way that we can actually see the electric field? There is. We can visualize the electric field using something called electric field lines. Okay. And these lines are a way of representing the direction and strength of the electric field Why? at different points in space. Okay. So imagine you have a positive charge. Uh huh. The electric field lines around this charge would point radially outward, like spokes on a wheel. Okay. And the closer the lines are together, the stronger the field. Okay. If you had a negative charge, the field lines would point radially inward. So we can draw these lines around any kind of configuration. Yes. yes. See how the electric field behaves. Exactly. And the chapter shows some examples of field lines around different charge configurations, like single charges, pairs of charges, mm -hmm. and even something called a dipole, which is a pair of equal and opposite charges separated by a small distance. Okay. It's kind of like a tiny electric magnet. Okay. This is starting to make a lot of sense. Good. Um, okay, but now I'm wondering, how do we actually measure the electric field? I mean, it's invisible, right? Right. That's where a concept called electric flux comes in. Okay, another new term. Don't worry, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Okay. So, imagine you have a stream of water flowing through a hoop. Okay. The amount of water that passes through the hoop depends on the size of the hoop and the angle at which the hoop is held relative to the stream, right? Right. If it's perpendicular, more water will flow through. Exactly. Electric flux is similar. It's a measure of how much electric field passes through a given surface. Okay. We can kind of think of the electric field lines as representing the flow of the electric field okay. and the surface as being like the hoop. Okay. So more field lines passing mm -hmm. through mm -hmm. means more electric flux. You got it. And this concept of electric flux is crucial for understanding a very powerful law in electrostatics, Gauss's law, but that's a story for another time. Okay, so this deep dive into the world of electric charges and fields has been, well, electrifying so far. It has. We've gone from the ancient Greeks rubbing amber yeah. to the concept of, like, these invisible fields and flux. It's amazing how much we've learned from just one chapter of a textbook. I know, it's a lot. It is. So we'll take a short break and come back to dive even deeper into the fascinating concepts of electric fields. Sounds good. Stay tuned. Welcome back. You ready to tackle Gauss's law? Absolutely. You mentioned it's a powerful tool for understanding electric fields, especially when things get a bit, you know, more complex. Yeah, definitely. It's kind of a shortcut for calculating the electric field, especially in situations where there's a lot of symmetry. Symmetry, okay. So think of it this way. Imagine you have a gift wrapped in a box. Okay. The shape of the box doesn't really tell you anything about what's inside. Yeah, you got to open it to see. Exactly. And in a similar way, Gauss's law tells us that the electric flux through a closed surface, think of it like an imaginary box, is only dependent on the total charge enclosed within that surface. So it doesn't matter what the box looks like. The shape itself doesn't matter, no. Interesting. So if we can find a clever way to draw a closed surface around a charge distribution, we can use Gauss's law to figure out the electric field without getting bogged down in, you know, really complicated calculations. Okay. That sounds pretty powerful. Can you give an example of how this works in practice? Absolutely. So let's consider a long, straight wire with charge uniformly distributed along its length. Imagine a really, really long power line. Okay, yeah, I can picture that. Now, because the wire is infinitely long, the electric field around it has to be radial, meaning it points outwards from the wire in all directions, like spokes on a wheel. Makes sense. Every point along the wire looks the same. Exactly. So the field can't have any direction that, you know, favors one side over another. Mm -hmm. Right. To apply Gauss's law, we can imagine an imaginary cylinder surrounding the wire. Oh. So the wire runs right through the center of the cylinder. So our gift box is a cylinder. Exactly. Now, since the electric field is radial, it's always perpendicular to the curved surface of the cylinder. Uh -huh. This means that there's no electric flux through the top or bottom of the cylinder, only through the curved surface. Oh, what? And because of the symmetry of the wire, the electric field strength is the same at every point on that curved surface. So to find the flux, we just multiply the electric field strength by the area of the curved surface. You got it. 
And Gauss's law tells us that this flux is equal to the total charge enclosed by the cylinder, divided by a constant called the permittivity of free space. And we can figure out the charge enclosed pretty easily, right? Yes, it's simply the charge density multiplied by the length of the cylinder, and from there, it's just a matter of rearranging the equation to solve for the electric field strength. So much simpler than trying to calculate it directly for every little bit of charge on the wire. It is. Gauss's law really is a powerful tool that exploits symmetry to simplify calculations. It's like a cheat code for physics problems. Kind of, it is. Now, let's try another scenario. Okay. Imagine an infinitely large flat sheet with a uniform charge density. Think of it like a never-ending charged piece of paper. Okay, got it. A flat sheet of charge that extends forever. Exactly. What do you think the electric field lines will look like in this case? Hmm. Well... Since the sheet's infinitely large, the field lines have to be perpendicular to the sheet. Okay, why do you think that? Well, otherwise, the field will be pointing in different directions at different points along the sheet. Right. And that doesn't make sense because every part of the sheet is the same. Excellent reasoning. You're absolutely right. The field lines have to be perpendicular to the sheet. So they'll either point outwards or inwards, depending on the charge. That's right. They'll point either directly outward if the sheet is positively charged or directly inward if it's negatively charged. Okay, so they're like straight arrows sticking out of the sheet. <laughs> what kind of Gaussian surface should we use here? A box-shaped Gaussian surface works well in this case. Okay, like a cube. Yeah, we can imagine a box with its two ends parallel to the sheet and its sides perpendicular to it. So just like with the cylinder and the wire, the flux will only pass through the two ends of the box, not the sides. Exactly. And by applying Gauss's law, we find something quite interesting. What's that? The electric field strength is constant everywhere. It doesn't depend on the distance from the sheet. Really? That's kind of counterintuitive. It is, it is a surprising result, but it makes sense when you think about the infinite nature of the sheet. Okay. As you move further away, you're encompassing more and more charge within your Gaussian box. Uh -huh. But the area of the ends of the box also increases, so the overall effect balances out. So no matter how far away you are from this infinite sheet of charge, you'll experience the same electric field strength. Precisely. It's a testament to the power of symmetry and how it can lead to unexpected results. Okay, I'm really starting to appreciate the elegance of Gauss's law. It is pretty elegant. It makes solving these problems much more manageable. It does. It does. Are you ready for one final application of Gauss's law? Bring it on. Okay. This time, we'll consider a uniformly charged, thin, spherical shell. Okay. Imagine a hollow sphere, like a soap bubble, with charge spread evenly on its surface. All right, got it. Now, just like with the long wire, the electric field around a spherical shell has to be radial due to the symmetry. Okay. It points either directly outward or inward from the center of the sphere, depending on whether the charge is positive or negative. Right, that makes sense. So should we use a spherical Gaussian surface for this one? Exactly. We can imagine a spherical surface concentric with the charged shell, and here's where things get really interesting. Okay. Let's first consider a point outside the shell, meaning our Gaussian sphere is larger than the charged shell. Okay, so we're imagining a point in space somewhere outside this charged soap bubble. Precisely. Now, when we apply Gauss's law in this case, we find something remarkable. The electric field outside the shell is exactly the same as if all the charge on the shell were concentrated at a single point at the center of the shell. Wow, really? Yeah, so from the perspective of a point outside the shell, it doesn't matter how the charge is distributed on the surface. It's like the shell shrinks down to a point. Exactly. It behaves as if all the charge were lumped together at the center. So to calculate the electric field at that point, mm -hmm. we can just use Kalum's law. Precisely. But here's the even more fascinating part. What happens if our point is inside the shell? meaning our Gaussian sphere is now smaller than the charged shell. Hmm. I'm not sure. I would guess the field would be weaker inside the shell since you're surrounded by less charge. That's a reasonable guess, but the actual answer is even more surprising. The electric field inside a uniformly charged spherical shell is zero. Zero. You mean there's no electric field at all inside this charged soap bubble? Exactly. Not a single electric field line penetrates the interior of the shell. It's like a perfect electric shield. So if you were standing inside this charged soap bubble, you wouldn't feel any electric force at all? Not a bit. It's a consequence of how the electric forces from all the charges on the shell perfectly cancel each other out inside the shell. That's incredible. I never would guess that. It is. It is a remarkable result, 
Goss's law has revealed a hidden truth about electric fields that would be very difficult to see without it. It really highlights the power of symmetry. It does. And this concept of a uniformly charged shell even has historical significance. Oh, how so? It was used in early models of the atom. Right, like the Rutherford model, where the atom is like a miniature solar system. That's right. But before Rutherford's model, there was an even earlier model okay. that envisioned the atom as a positively charged point nucleus surrounded by a uniform density of negative charge up to a certain radius. So kind of like a tiny planet with a negatively charged atmosphere. Exactly. And using Gauss's law, physicists could calculate the electric field at different distances from the nucleus of this model atom. Neutral. Just like with the spherical shell, the field inside the negatively charged region is zero, and outside that region, it behaves as if all the charges were concentrated at the nucleus. It's amazing how one law can be applied to so many different things. It really is a cornerstone of electrostatics. Now, before we wrap up our deep dive into electric charges and fields, there's one more concept we need to explore. Okay, what's that? It's called an electric dipole. Okay, I'm ready. So an electric dipole is simply a pair of equal and opposite charges separated by a small distance. So instead of a single charge, we have two charges close together, but with opposite signs. Exactly. Think of it like a tiny electric magnet. Okay. And just like magnets, dipoles have their own unique electric fields and behaviors. So what can you tell me about the electric field of a dipole? It's a bit more complex than that of a single charge. Okay. It doesn't just point radially outward or inward. Okay. Instead, it has a more intricate pattern that depends on the orientation of the dipole. What does that look like? Imagine a dipole with the positive charge on the left and the negative charge on the right. Okay. The electric field lines will emerge from the positive charge, curve around, and terminate on the negative charge. So they kind of loop around. Exactly. And the strength of the field decreases more rapidly with distance compared to the field of a single charge. Why is that? It's because the positive and negative charges partially cancel each other's effects. The further away you are from the dipole, the more complete this cancellation becomes. That makes sense. You mentioned dipoles behave like tiny magnets. What did you mean by that? So just like a compass needle aligns itself with the Earth's magnetic field, a dipole will experience a torque, a twisting force, when placed in an external electric field. Oh, okay. This torque tries to align the dipole with the direction of the field. So it's not just a force, it's like a twisting force as well. Exactly. And this behavior of dipoles has some interesting consequences. Like what? It explains how a charged comb can attract small pieces of uncharged paper. Wait, really? I thought charges only attracted opposite charges. How can a charged comb attract something that's neutral? It's all thanks to dipoles. When you bring a charged comb near a piece of paper, the electric field of the comb induces a dipole moment in the paper. Okay. This means that the charges within the paper molecules rearrange themselves slightly, creating a temporary dipole. So the comb is creating tiny little magnets within the paper. Exactly. And since the comb's field isn't perfectly uniform, there's a net force on the induced dipole in the paper, causing it to be attracted to the comb. Wow, that's so cool. It is. Now, electric dipoles aren't just theoretical things. Okay. They play a really crucial role in many real-world phenomena. Like what? Many molecules, like water, are naturally polar, meaning they have a permanent dipole moment. Okay. This is due to the way the electrons are distributed within the molecule. Got it. In water, the oxygen atom has a slight negative charge, right. and the hydrogen atoms have a slight positive charge. Uh -huh. This creates a dipole moment that gives water many of its unique properties. Interesting. So dipoles are the reason water is so amazing. Exactly. They're also crucial in understanding things like dielectric materials, which are used in capacitors, and the behavior of electric fields in matter. Wow, so these seemingly abstract concepts really do connect to the real world. Absolutely. Now, ready for our last topic for this deep dive? Yeah, hit me. We're going to talk about how to deal with situations where we have a continuous distribution of charge instead of discrete point charges. Continuous distribution of charge. Okay, so far we've been dealing with situations where we have individual point charges or collections of point charges. Right. But in many real-world scenarios, charge is distributed continuously over a line, a surface, or even a volume. Okay. Think of a charged wire, a charged sheet of metal, or a charged sphere. Okay, yeah, I can picture that. Now, 
Trying to calculate the electric field due to a continuous charge distribution using Coulomb's law directly would be a nightmare. Yeah, I can imagine. We'd have to divide the charge distribution into tiny, tiny pieces. Okay. Calculate the field due to each piece. Uh -huh. And then add up all those contributions. That sounds terrible. It would be. So, is there a better way? Thankfully, there is. We can use the concept of charge density. Charge density. Okay, what's that? Charge density tells us how much charge is packed into a given region of space. Okay. There are three types. Linear, surface, and volume charge density. All right, so let's break those down. Okay. Linear charge density, we use the Greek letter lambda for that. Okay. It tells us how much charge is distributed per unit length along a line. So, like, how many people are crammed into a subway car? Exactly. Surface charge density, denoted by sigma, tells us how much charge is distributed per unit area on a surface. So like how many people are packed onto a beach. Precisely. And finally, we have volume charge density, denoted by rho, which tells us how much charge is distributed per unit volume within a three-dimensional object. Like how many fish are in a tank. Exactly. Okay, I'm getting it. So these charge densities help us describe the charge. Exactly, in continuous systems. But how does this help us calculate the electric field? We can use these charge densities in conjunction with Gauss's law. Oh, okay, so instead of dealing with individual charges, we treat the charge as spread out smoothly. Precisely. And just like with the examples we talked about earlier, the key is to choose a Gaussian surface that takes advantage of the symmetry of the charge distribution. Do you do an example? Absolutely. Let's go back to that long, straight wire with a uniform charge density that we discussed earlier. Okay. Remember, we used a cylindrical Gaussian surface to enclose a segment of the wire. Right. Now, instead of thinking of the wire as a collection of individual point charges, we can treat it as having a continuous linear charge density, lambda. So we're smoothing it out. Exactly. Mm. The total charge enclosed within our Gaussian cylinder is simply the linear charge density multiplied by the length of the cylinder. Right. And from there, we apply Gauss's law to find the electric field, just as we did before. So much easier. It is. It's a really elegant approach, and this approach can be generalized to other charge distributions as well. Okay. For example, if we have a uniformly charged infinite plane sheet, we use a box-shaped Gaussian surface and the surface charge density sigma. Got it. So no matter how the charge is distributed, as long as there's some symmetry, we can use Gauss's law in conjunction with the appropriate charge density to find the electric field. This is making a lot of sense. Good. It's a powerful tool for electrostatics. This deep dive has been amazing. I feel like I've learned so much about how electricity works. It's been great exploring it with you. But before we wrap up, there's one thing I'm still wondering about. What's that? We've talked a lot about static charges, but what happens when charges start moving? That's when we enter the realm of electric currents, which is a whole other story. It sounds like a deep dive for another time. It is. It is. You know, it's really amazing how much ground we've covered in our exploration of electric charges and fields. I know, right? Starting from those simple observations like a spark from a sweater uh -huh. or a charged comb picking up bits of paper. Right. And then we dug deep into these like fundamental laws that govern those phenomena. It's amazing. And we've learned that charges come in, well, Two types, positive and negative. Yeah. And they exude these forces on each other, oh. even when they're not actually touching. Yeah, it's like there's this like invisible web connecting everything. And then there's the idea of the electric field, yeah. which helps us really visualize and understand these interactions. Right, like a map showing us the direction and strength of the electric force at any point in space. And then, like... Gauss's law just comes in and blows everything wide open. I know, right? It's such a powerful tool for figuring out electric fields. Especially when things are symmetrical. Yeah, exactly. We even, you know, went down to the microscopic level. I know, it's wild. Thinking about early models of the atom where the electric force is so important. It's incredible how much complexity there is beneath those simple, everyday things we see. It really is a testament to, you know, the power of science. For sure. Like, through observation, experimentation, and these theories, right. we've uncovered some of the universe's biggest secrets. It's mind boggling. Yeah. And for me, one of the most incredible things is this idea that even empty space mm -hmm. isn't really empty. Yeah. It's filled with these invisible fields that exert forces. It's a lot to wrap your head around. It really is. It challenges how we think about the world. And then like the fact that we can describe these complex interactions uh -huh. with like elegant math. 
like Coulomb's law and Goss's law. It's amazing. It really speaks to the like underlying order of the universe. It does. And it's so satisfying uncovering these principles that govern everything. Oh, absolutely. So as we wrap up our deep dive, I hope our listeners are left with a sense of wonder. Me too. There's still so much to learn about electricity and magnetism. Oh, absolutely. And as we keep digging deeper, we'll find even more fascinating things. I can't wait. So everyone, keep exploring, keep asking questions. Yeah, don't lose that curiosity. The universe is full of secrets, and this is just the beginning of our journey.